And um, to get started, I am pleased to welcome President Ruth Watkins. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted to be able to join you in celebration of the 30th annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation. I'm getting just a little bit of feedback. Is that, should I step away maybe from the mic? Let's try that. Better, yes? Excellent. Well, I have to say, this is the 30th annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation. It is, however, the first in a pandemic, I'm pretty sure. And I must say, I, as strange as it is to be in this environment, I so appreciate having a live group of people to listen. It's very difficult to uh, give talks and to interact by Zoom only. So thank you for being here, students and our special guests, and of course the Eccles family. It's really my great pleasure to uh, welcome the Eccles. Spencer, right here, Mr. Eccles, right in front, joined by his family, uh, Lisa Eccles, Katie Eccles, Hope Eccles, Clara Eccles, and uh, Grace Eccles Burnett. <laughs> so I think I got all the Eccles. Did I get all the Eccles? Very good. Well, this is a special day. It's an important way that we uh, remember and continue the legacy of David Eccles and all of the incredible success that has happened in business and entrepreneurship in Utah and at the University of Utah campus because of the Eccles family. I want to uh, particularly extend a warm welcome to our students, those who are with us, and the many hundreds of alum and faculty members and other students who are with us by Zoom. So special welcome to all of you and thank you for being here today. And I'd like to uh, extend a special welcome to our guest speaker, Joel, your business acumen, your leadership, your distinguished career make you the perfect convocation speaker for us today. Now a little bit about the history of the convocation. Each year we gather on this occasion to honor Spence Eccles for the vital role that he played in the creation of the David Eccles School of Business. His effort in working with the Emma Eccles Jones uh, Foundation and also Emma Eccles herself to establish a $15 million endowment has benefited the business school since 1991. That generous gift and the naming of the business school pay tribute to Mrs. Jones's father, Spencer, Spence's grandfather, David Eccles, one of the leading figures in the economic development of Utah and the Pacific Northwest. We are so honored here at the University of Utah campus to bear the name, the David Eccles School of Business, and to remember this incredible legacy of entrepreneurship and business success. It's a remarkable thing. The David Eccles School of Business has been on an upward trajectory of growth and success, achievement over the past decades. A critical part of this has been because of the Emma Eccles Jones Endowment Funding. The endowment gift has allowed scholarship support, support for faculty, support for creative endeavors that have accelerated the success of the David Eccles School of Business. It's been a catalyst for excellence throughout the school we are thankful to the trustees of the Emma Eccles Jones Foundation who are here with us today, Spence Eccles and Katie Eccles, for your continued support and your involvement. So to the whole Eccles family, you have done so much to support an important engine of success here at the University of Utah in the David Eccles School of Business and frankly across every aspect of the University of Utah campus. You have played such a vital role in the success of this institution. And another person who's played a vital role in the success of this institution is Dean Taylor Randall, the Dean of the David Eccles School of Business. A remarkable, creative, energetic, passionate leader advancing the U, advancing the David Eccles School of Business, and advancing the economic climate of our state. Dean Randall, to you. Thank you. We are going to have such a remarkable speaker here today uh, to talk to us a little bit about entrepreneurial leadership. Joel, we welcome you. We're thrilled to have you here today. As you all know, entrepreneurial grit is part of our core value here at the David Eccles School of Business. And in fact, 
David Eccles, I think, was Utah's first and most successful entrepreneur. He founded many, many companies. At time of his death, I believe he was involved in at least 26 different companies here in the Intermountain West. Um, we're meeting under very di different circumstances today. We appreciate your patience. We appreciate your patience with our educational offering this year. We know that uh, all of us will develop an incredible amount of resilience from what we're going through uh, here right now. It's my pleasure to introduce to you the grandson of David Eccles, Spence Eccles. I have been the dean of this business school now going on 12 years. And I learned early on that the pace of change and the pace of a leader is an important thing for an organization. And I would say my first week as dean, Spence let me know that this place was going to move fast. The motto of his organization used to be giving 110%. I will tell you one thing. It's not 110% that he gives. It's about 155. It may be more. At 86 years old, we celebrate the 30th convocation. And he was responsible for the naming of this school. The endowment that was given has literally provided millions upon millions of dollars to scholarships, to faculty, and to creating excellence at this university. At 86 year old, he has not slowed down. In fact, he continues to be one of the great philanthropists in this community. I learned in this crisis that great leaders rise to an occasion. And I would say Spence Eccles was one of those in this community that immediately came in with his optimism and said, the best is yet to come. Ladies and gentlemen, Spence Eccles. turned on, wired up. Thank you very much, President Watkins and Dean, for your kind remarks. And I'm thrilled, as always, to participate in the annual Spencer Fox Eccles Convocation, the 30th annual, uh, yes, 30 years ago. Our speaker at that time was uh, Richard Davidson the CEO of Union Pacific Railroad. And I had had the pleasure of serving on their board for 30 years also. You know, I recall the first time like it was yesterday. And I think I was such a young fella then. And well, now I just like to think of myself as more of fully aged, like a fine wine. But, but, I, I digress. So over these three decades, keynote speeches from outstanding leaders in business and industry have brought us wise counsel, unique pers perspective, fascinating stories, and yes, great bus business advice. I can assure you this year will be no exception. But first, let me say on this 30th anniversary, I can't help but reflect on the accomplishments of my grandfather, David Eccles, and the generosity and foresight of my Aunt Emma Eccles Jones, who established the endowment in his honor and memory that continues to enrich the school today. I believe they would both be proud of this B School's remarkable growth in excellence and the impact it continues to make educating, mentoring, and shaping the future of thousands of students who will be tomorrow's business leaders. And it's heartening to know that the legacy of David Eccles, his entrepreneurial spirit, business savvy, and tremendous work ethic, and also his commitment to the communities that he lived in. It inspires our students. And this year's speaker, Joel Peterson, most certainly shares those inspiring attributes. Mr. Peterson is the founding partner of Peterson Partners, a Salt Lake City-based investment management firm with a billion dollars, yes, I said billion, with a capital B, under his management. Wonder who turned that page upside down. He not only is a business leader, an entrepreneur, and an investor, but also 
outstanding and tremendous effective teacher. For nearly 30 years, he's been on the faculty of Sanford University Graduate School of Business, teaching courses in real estate investment, entrepreneurship, and of course, as a teacher, teaching leadership. In fact, he's been called for, he's been called the Mr. Rogers of Silicon Valley, kind of, a, you know, nice, nice to be in the neighborhood type of guy for the way he connects with, most importantly, students. And he has appeared on CNN, CBS Radio, and Fox and & Friends, and BN, and, and Bloomberg, among others, because they value his effective way of connecting with audiences. But before founding Peterson Partners, he was CEO of Trammell Crow Company, which was at the time the largest private commercial real estate development firm in the world. Before that, he had served as chairman of JetBlue for 12 years, and as a chairman of venerable, the venerable Stanford Hoover Institute. And he also is the author of several books on leadership. A much sought after board member who has served on served on nearly 40 major corporate boards throughout the years. Today, Joel serves on the board of two Salt Lake-based companies, Franklin Covey and PacSize. And oh yes, his own education. Well, he has an MBA at Harvard Business School, and he earned his bachelor's degree here in Utah at that school down south, who beat Navy really badly the other day. Was that it? Well, that was pure pleasure. But even, even then, his outstanding talents as a student and great future were recognized. Yes, he graduated as Victorian, Vic, valedictorian of his class. I was just saying this. I'm glad I notified my beautician that I was going to definitely wear it today. That's good. Uh, I feel bad. So please join me in giving a warm David Eccles School welcome to our outstanding 30th Annual Convocation Speaker, Joel Peterson. And welcome, Joel. Uh, the mic is all yours, sir. I'm delighted to be with you uh, today and honored uh, to be here. Um, I'm not going to ask anybody's permission to take off this mask, but I'm far enough away that Joe Biden would approve me taking off my mask uh, today, and I want to communicate with you. I taught a course, <sighs> I can breathe. I taught a course uh, at Stanford last spring, and uh, I normally really connect with my students. We create a community in the classroom. It's phenomenal. And I told a joke early on, and it was dead silence on the other side. And then I realized everybody had their mic off. And it was really just hard to connect. So normally, what I would do is I'd be walking up and cold calling you and asking questions. I won't be able to do that uh, this time. But I thank uh, Taylor Randall and Ruth Watkins uh, for the invitation. Uh, today. I found out this morning that uh, your president and I both grew up in Iowa. More on that later. Uh, but I also want to recognize the Eccles family and everything that they've brought to the state of Utah and this university. Uh, David Eccles was really one of the great entrepreneurs uh, of, of America ever. Uh, he was the Andrew Carnegie, as it were, of the Intermountain West, of Scott's a Scotsman. He came to the United States when he was 14 years old uh, with, with uh, six months of formal education. By the time he was 21, he had formed his own business. He then formed 54 new businesses over the next 42 years uh, and left a legacy. More importantly, he left the legacy of these family members here who have followed in his footsteps and accomplished tremendous things and given back 
in ways that any entrepreneur hopes their own progeny will do. So uh, the Eccles family has blessed us all and I want to, to recognize them. Also, uh, recognizing the, the leadership here of the business school is uh, worth doing. I think you've got a fantastic university president and a remarkable dean here. This masters of business creation uh, notion is something that I wish we'd thought of at Stanford. It's really a great idea. And I think Utah has always been known for its medical school and its law school and increasingly is being known for its business school. So congratulations, Dean. Um, I asked uh, Dean Taylor if I could, um, uh, Dean Taylor Randall, <laughs> He's got, his, his name is backwards, you know. It should be Randall Taylor, but anyway. <laughs> I'm sure you've lived with that your whole life. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I asked him if I could give him a little bit on my uh, history, if that might be interesting uh, to students, because I know when I was your age, I had no idea what I wanted to do or, you know, what the world offered. And so maybe by tracing my uh, steps for a few minutes here at the beginning, it might give you a sense of how somebody who's lost and meandering can kind of figure out their way over time. So uh, as with the Eccles, my progenitors uh, came from Europe uh, in the mid-19th century Western migration. Uh, several of them pushed handcarts across the plains, uh, and then they were assigned various uh, cities. My, uh, my grandfather was the first of their progeny to be born in the United States. He was the first to go to college. He became a county extension agent out in Vernal, Utah. Uh, for those of you who know the geography, that's out where the Dinosaur National Monument is. And my dad grew up there. Uh, he started his business when he was a young man bought an old Model T Ford and delivered produce around that little town. And um, then he went to college when he was 16. Uh, he actually then went directly to graduate school, completed his PhD before the um, Pearl Harbor, and was the first person in line to sign up for the military, at which time he came up, became a bomb disposal officer, um, was sent to Columbia to learn how to, how to uh, disengage ordinance. And, um, and so there's a couple of lessons that came out of this. The first was that I then, when I was 11 years old, started my first business and it was exactly the same business. I grew fresh vegetables uh, and sold them around the neighborhood. We found a letter to my grandmother a number of years later where I said, Dear Grandma, I had a great summer. I made $14 and I paid Ted a nickel. Ted was my little brother who pulled his wagon around uh, delivering the vegetables. So uh, I also learned from him uh, something that I had to overcome. He grew up in the Great Depression with the threat of war and became very cautious. And uh, you know he would never have become an entrepreneur. Becoming an entrepreneur requires risk taking, assessing risks, doing trade-off. So I had to overcome that. He also taught me something that was really valuable from his years uh, in the military. He was in the Battle of Iwo Jima, where his aircraft carrier, the USS Saratoga, was hit by five kamikazes, and as the bomb disposal officer on deck, it was his job to disengage that ordinance. And from that, he used to tell me as a kid, when there's a fire, run towards it. And I think that's one of the more important entrepreneurial lessons for any of you who's considering entrepreneurship. Don't let smoke go for a while, because it will always turn into flame and it always gets worse. So run towards the fire. Um, so I grew up doing minimum wage jobs. I, I thinned sugar beets, I was a bus boy, I was a dishwasher, I, uh, I was a mailman, um, and I earned my way through college. My tuition, this will make uh, you all feel bad, my tuition at Michigan State University, which is the only place I could afford to go, was $109.25 a quarter, if you can imagine that. But that was the only place I could go. And uh, then I went, I went one year there and two years to BYU, where I was able to uh, earn $30, uh, work 30 hours a week. Um, 
And so I'd always worked really hard. And I would say that the lessons from that, there's something about working with your hands. Uh, there's something about rubbing shoulders with people uh, who have menial labor. I remember in the sugar beet thinning job, by 10.30 a.m., I was ready to quit. My day was done. And I learned to get up early. I learned to show up no matter how I felt. And I learned to, bo to deal with bosses who would cut me no slack. And those were really, really valuable lessons. In fact, I've often said to my kids, I learned more in minimum wage jobs than I ever learned at Harvard Business School about how to be successful uh, in business. When I was at Harvard, I wasn't sure, I still wasn't sure about business. I'd, I'd gone to Harvard Business School and I was sitting next to all these MIT PhDs and CPAs and lawyers and people who had much better educations uh, than I. And I wasn't sure I, I, wasn't sure I was going to make it through business school. So I took a law school class and I really liked it. And then I took a, a doctoral class and didn't like it. Um, and, uh, and I, was plan I told uh, Ruth uh, this morning that I was considering becoming I was thinking, because it was the only leadership post I knew of becoming president of Michigan State University, uh, and that, talk, that class talked me out of that. So here I am. I'm in the second year of business school, and I still don't know what I want to do with my life. And I don't know if any of you has ever felt that way. Is, am I on the right path? Am I making the right choices? And Trammell Crow came to visit uh, to give a speech at Harvard Business School. I don't remember a word he said in his speech, but I do remember a student asking him, Mr. Crow, what accounts for your success? And he had a bald head, and he went down and he scratched his head for what seemed like a minute. And he looked up and he said, love. And I was taken aback and I thought, oh my gosh, it was the only four letter word these Harvard Business School students didn't know. Um, but they were, they were gobsmacked. They couldn't believe it, but I thought, my gosh, this guy has tapped into something really powerful. He loves what he does, he loves the people he works with, and he loves the impact he's able to make. And that is the essence of entrepreneurship, you know, and so uh, that really had a big impact on me. So I, I went up after his talk and asked him if I could uh, have an interview with him, if I could meet with him. And he said, sure, I'll be in uh, Boston again soon for a uh, board meeting with Prudential, why don't you stop by the hotel? So I arrived early at the Ritz-Carlton uh, in Boston and phoned his room and just said, Mr. Crow, I'm down here in the lobby, just wanted you to know when you get ready. And he, uh, he said, well, come on up to the room. So I walk up to the room and here's this groggy Texan who's just awakened, with a, he's in a tank top and boxer shorts, and he says, come on in. So I walk in and he says, have a seat. And all of the chairs are covered with bags and everything like that. He said, just sit on the bed. So I sat on his unmade bed as he went into the bathroom and shaved and interviewed me. And at the end of it, I had a job and I was sent to Paris, France. Ten months later, Diana and I were in Paris with our little daughter and I was a real estate developer. So here's another lesson. My very first assignment was to, raise 30, was to raise $10 million for two 30-story towers on the eastern edge of Paris. And uh, I did my very best, the kind of financial analysis that probably wasn't as good as what you can do, but it was the best I could do at that time in my life. It was a sophisticated financial analysis, and I came up saying, oh my gosh, this is not enough to finish this project, and whoever puts up the $10 million is going to lose it. So I told the CFO at the time uh, that this, we, we needed to do something else because this wasn't going to work. And he said, it's my job to decide about the money to be raised. It's your job to go raise it. And so I went and I interviewed with McKinsey uh, in Paris. The managing partner got word that I did, and this is maybe a little bit of an entrepreneurial mindset. When the managing partner got, the, got word that I was doing that, he, he quizzed me about it. And I, as I described to him my conclusion, uh, he actually backed off and he, and he canceled the equity raise, turned the project back to our venture partner. We worked for fees rather than equity. And within a year, he'd invited me back to Dallas to become the treasurer of the company. And within another year, uh, I was the chief financial officer had left the company. And so at age 29, I found myself as the chief financial officer of a company 
on the verge of insolvency, which is another lesson. Don't fear hard times. Uh, I was able to turn that into the very best thing that could ever have happened to me. So um, I want to now go through a, a number of slides. I'm a teacher by, by training, so I want to go through a number of slides on the topic for today, which is entrepreneurial leadership, which I think you've all gotten a copy of this uh, book. It doesn't seem to want to, there we go. So here's the issue that uh, was interesting to me, <coughs> is startups fail. You know, you, if, for those of you who are interested in entrepreneurship, you've chosen a, an area that is risky, where a lot of things fail. But of the successes, 90% of them significantly morph their business plan. They significantly modify their business plan. Yet few of them become enduring institutions. So that was the issue that I was really uh, interested in. So this thing doesn't seem to want to advance. There's, so I started to say, well, why is that? And, it, and I figured out it's really because of the leadership. Who runs these things really determines whether or not they modify and adjust their business plan to the market and succeed. And I found that the leaders had tendencies to be entrepreneurs who are great at innovating, lighting fires, getting things started, but you've heard of this problem of the founder's trap, where a lot of times they're unable to take it to the next level. There are managers. Managers deal with complexity. There are administrators who deal with policy and longer-term impacts of things. There are politicians who make deals, at least they used to. Um, and then there are presiders who maintain the status quo. And that these were the kinds of leaders that we found. I thought, gosh, none of those really is adequate. So I, that's when I drew on this early life ex work that I've told you about, uh, a professional career that I'll tell you about, my own career, my own investment results, and then Stanford Guess. So here's where I was born. When I told you I was born in Iowa, we both came from Iowa. These are the Quonset Huts, <laughs> Pamel Court. Pamel in, Court. Uh, <laughs> no way. So it's, see something good can come out of Pamel Court. <laughs> <laughs> and it's right there. <laughs> but this was, my, uh, this was my first home. Then we, we really moved upscale um, to this beautifully landscaped home in Ames, Iowa. So I grew up here. This is where my first memories uh, were. So um, then the question is, how do you get from that to this uh, professional experience where 19 years I was at Trammell Crow Company, that came to an end. And then uh, Steve Covey called me and asked me if I would be vice chairman of the Covey Leadership Center. I helped it merge with Franklin Quest. Then Stanford called and asked me to start teaching there. I've taught those four courses over those years. I then started to buy companies, uh, first in the private equity world and then in the venture world, and then I started a real estate uh, effort. One of the companies we invested in was JetBlue. Uh, I basically was hired to build Terminal 5. If any of you ever remembers flying, remember when we used to fly? Uh, when we used to fly, it was into Terminal 5 at JFK. And um, that, so I built that and I came in on time, on budget in, at JFK and everybody was amazed. And so I became the lead director. Uh, we changed the CEO and I was asked to become the chairman of JetBlue. And I did that for about 12 years. And then 10 years or so ago, I went in to Hoover and then became the chairman there. In the meantime, we had seven kids and 29 grandkids. So that's my, and I, can, I count that last as professional experience under the direction of Diana. <clears throat> uh, then my investment experience that I drew on to come to these conclusions was I've invested in seven what they call unicorns, companies that go from zero to a billion dollars in value. Uh, three large turnarounds and then dozens of enduring enterprises, lots of real estate and lots of uh, companies there. Then borrowed experience. You know, you don't, have to, you don't have to do everything yourself. You can actually learn from others. So at Stanford, we have an amazing magnet to get world-class leaders. So some of these names you may recognize, Steve Ballmer uh, at uh, Microsoft, John Donahoe was at eBay and now runs, Microsoft, or now runs Nike. So uh, and you may recognize Jim Mattis, Secretary of Defense. Uh, 
and then others that you might not recognize, but these are amazing leaders, many of them with incredible entrepreneurial instincts. And the way we organize this at Stanford is we tell them to come in, they have five minutes to speak, and then they have 85 minutes to respond to whatever questions students ask. We ask students to turn off their phones, no Twitter, no quoting, and so we have chairman and CEOs of big public companies who will come in and respond to whatever students questions have. So I've listened now for 15 years to these kinds of people. Then uh, the real issue that I was, wanted to get at was how do you go from having an idea to developing an enduring enterprise? So idea is not a product, does not automatically become a service, does not automatically become a profitable business. So there's a lot of steps in there, but I found that to develop a profitable business there are maps. There are ways to get there that are really well developed in the business school, and you'll probably recognize these, but first thing is you can deal with operations. You can either increase revenue or cut costs. You can deal with your balance sheet. You can uh, reduce capital intensity. You can change the cost of capital, and you can change sources. The third thing you can do is, has to do with team and culture, the human resource side of the equation, and then the final thing you can do is deal with strategy. So these are the major levers that you have when you go from idea to product to profitable business. Quick story, um, I, I've known for really pressing my entrepreneurs that I work with to develop profits as early on as they can. I went to a Bonobos board meeting. Uh, did any of you know Bonobos? Yeah, I was, so I was the first investor in Bonobos and was kind of the lead director there. And, uh, I always went early to the board meetings, and one day I had the time wrong on my calendar, so what would have been 15 minutes early was now 15 minutes late. So I slipped into the back of the room and sat quietly, as you do when you're, when you're late. And then uh, finally, 10 minutes or so had gone by, and so I said, so when do we make our first dollar of profit? And the room burst into laughter. I thought, what is going on? And they all said, we all had a bet as to how long it would take you to ask when we made our first dollar profit. So to me, these maps are really vital to get to a profitable business. But a profitable business is not an enduring company. There are a lot So the issue that I'm trying to think about is how do you get to become an enduring company? So I'm going to run through some slides fairly quickly here that will just kind of give you the the outline of the book. If you're really interested, you can read the book. Um, so I, I learned a lot of this from the seven unicorns and from the three turnarounds, large turnarounds that I was involved in. But here's the model I had. Building a business, you drill piers all the way to bedrock on these four levers, operations, finance, HR, and strategy. When you're building a, a durable enterprise, however, you're building on piers of trust, goals, team, and execution. Now these sound really fuzzy, you know, so I can see eyes glazing over here. And I want you to know these are every bit as hard-edged and difficult and important and doable as anything that you would do uh, in the operations finance HR strategy. So I used my um, experience in the building industry to say, you know, you can build a, an umpteen story building if you have a firm foundation. So this idea of drilling piers all the way, you know, when you drill piers, you pour a lot of concrete and a lot of steel into the earth and then you cover it up. You feel like, I don't have anything to show for all these millions of dollars I've spent on that. And yet that's what holds the building up. If you don't do that, this is what you get. You don't have a, so again, an idea is not a product. A product is not a business. A profitable business is not an enduring company. So you have to go through these steps. So this is what this book is about. So here are the four peers that need to be drilled to bedrock. The first one is trust. And basically, they have to be built around a leader. And when I mentioned to you that leaders came in those five flavors, what I've found is that the great entrepreneurial leaders have elements of all five of these. And if they don't, they bring teams on. Business is a team sport. So they bring people in to, to, to uh, cover all of these bases. Uh, so they tie that together. So a little bit like for any of you who follow baseball, you know that they have this notion of the five-tool player. Um, and I've developed this, I, which, and then this pictures of Willie Mays. You run, throw, field, hit for average, and hit for power. The same thing is about the entrepreneurial leader. Has five skills, and they really relate to these five roles. 
they have entrepreneurial instinct, but they're not only innovators. They're not only fire starters. They really have the ability to preside, to, to cut deals, to manage complexity, et cetera. And if they don't, they make sure they've got others. And that, if you have that kind of a leader, they get all around the compass. So, for example, your university president here has to deal with a board, has to deal with students, has to deal with faculty. She has to be able to get all the way around the compass. So, in effect, you have to be an entrepreneurial leader. Now, people are surprised when I show this picture of Alan Mulally. Alan Mulally was the head of Boeing and then the head of Ford. And when I say he was an entrepreneurial leader, they say, no, no, he's a big corporate boss. Well, I've had Alan into class four times now. He is the quintessential entrepreneurial leader. I would put Alan Mulally in charge of the University of Utah, in charge of any of our small companies, in charge of any problem. Uh, so that's what entrepreneurial leaders do. So here's how we secure the foundation. The first is trust. Here's what trust means. Uh, I'll go through these fairly quickly. Um, but the first thing you have to do is you have to become trustworthy. And that means assessing your core values and making sure you've adjusted your personal operating system so it's consistent. If there's any gap between what you say and you do, people will learn not to trust you. And if you can't be trusted, you can't lead. And the second thing is you have to intentionally build a high trust culture. And you can do that. The good news is you can be intentional about it. There are laws that, in fact, uh, the first book I wrote, I wonder where this will advance. Maybe I'm doing this the wrong way. No. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. Sorry about that. The first book I wrote is called The Ten Laws of Trust, and I really determined that there were ten laws. There are ways that you can be sure that you increase trust. So th this book was about that, and I wrote it uh, with American Management Association. They were bought by HarperCollins, and HarperCollins said, we'd like to republish this, but we want you to think about the questions that have that are asked most often, and the question were, if you've been betrayed, and by the way, if you trust, you will be betrayed at some point in your life. The only way to keep from ever being betrayed is to never trust. You'll live a really small life, but you can keep from being betrayed. Uh, but how do you keep from becoming wary? So uh, that was one of the issues, and the second one was, how do you know the trust level of your organization? So I went to work with Franklin Covey on coming up with a 10-question diagnostic where you could get a score and then test it a year later and a year later and a year later and see if we're increasing trust. So the first peer is trust. The second peer is mission. Mission gives meaning. People want to be a respected member of a winning team doing something meaningful. And so clarity around mission is a really important thing to develop. And that is really hard. I always look at uh, Churchill who was considered this great World War II leader when he gave his speech to Parliament when he was first made Prime Minister. It's clear what his mission was, victory. He gave the sign of victory and when he, after Pearl Harbor, these two pictures were taken by Yusuf Karsh, Canadian photographer, when he went and spoke to the Canadian Parliament. The one on the left is the one that uh, Karsh was not satisfied with and he kept getting these nice, pleasant pictures of Churchill, which was not, the pictures were not consistent with Churchill's mission. So Karsh reached over and grabbed the cigar out of his hand. Churchill leaned in and glowered, and he snapped the photo, and this is one of the most iconic photos of, of uh, the war. There are a lot of business examples of mission, but it's really important. Once you're trusted, you have to have a clear, simple, memorable mission. The third thing you have to do is you have to secure a team, and there is a process for hiring great people. It includes sourcing, interviewing, doing due diligence, uh, coaching, there's an onboarding process, there's a feedback process, and then there's firing. You have to be able to fire people if you're going to be a great entrepreneurial leader. Your job is to keep the best team on the field at all times. And so that's your goal. So actually when I wrote this book, I was uh, helped by a, an associate editor of the Harvard Business Review. And the one chapter that he said, we want to republish this in the Harvard Business Review was the one on firing with empathy. So, um, and then finally execution, I'll just blast through that. Here are the 10 things that every entrepreneurial leader is gonna have to deal with. And so I'll just flash through them quickly and you can consider these, but maybe I'll just run through them rather than say anything. There's a lot that could be said on each one of these, but these are the issues. If you wanna become an entrepreneurial leader and build an enduring company, you're gonna have to do
each of these. So uh, execution comes down to project management, and I have a, we could talk about that if we had time. So here's the simple map. I believe in simple maps. It was Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. that said, I would not give a fig for the simplicity this side of complexity, but I would give my life for the simplicity the other side of complexity. Most of us get hung up in complexity. If you want to execute, if you want to make things work, it has to get simple again. So this is a simple map and one that you can remember and use, and there's a whole checklist there that will take you from idea to product to profitable company to in, or profitable business to enduring company. Uh, Jim Mattis has become a little bit of a friend, and this book starts out, you'll see that the first, uh, the introduction is by Stanley McChrystal, who is the four-star general, is the head of uh, JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. And he had the nicest thing anybody could ever say, which was that Joel uh, shapes things. You don't feel his hand on the tiller, but he shapes events. And I just love that expression. And then when Jim Mattis sent me this note after he read the book, I thought, I'm ready to die. You know, um, so I don't know if we have any time left for Q and A. We certainly do. Let's take a let's take a few questions. We ask you to maybe to stand up and just scream it out. Can you hear me? Okay. The first question comes from Justin. Um, what has been the most memorable piece of advice in regards to business that you have ever received? Uh, there's a lot, and most of them happen. Uh, based on mistakes. You know how, you know how in a, when you take a test, you don't remember uh, the 98 answers you got right. You sure remember the two you got wrong. So for me, it's mostly in the mistake. And here's the, the one that I've made more than once, and that is hire, hire slowly, fire quickly. You know, take your time in hiring. Really do due diligence. Really, in fact, the, the best person I've had help me with hiring said, Four hour, a four-hour in-depth in interview from the beginning of life to now is really what you should do for a key position. And I think, I think he's right about that. But most of the time, I've known when things aren't working right, and I'll put up with it for a year or more. So, yeah. The next question. So I didn't, I didn't hear all the words there. Besides, so I'm going to have my translator here. <laughs> Besides education, what's the best investment you can make in your future? Uh, well, boy, I'm glad they mentioned edu education because I do think education is. Well. But to me, there's nothing. You know, there's an expression they use in Silicon Valley a lot, which is "fail fast." And what they really mean by that, it's not that failure is so great or that you should look to fail, but do it fast. Get out into the market. Test things. Get real customer feedback. And so to me, one of the ways that you learn, and, and that's why I love my minimum wage jobs. I was out there sweating and working hard, getting up early, trying things every single day. So to me, getting up early, working hard, overcoming stuff, and that, those are great education. Adversity is a wonderful teacher. We never look for it, we never love it, but we always get our best lessons out of it. Great. David Decker asks, what would you consider your biggest failure and what did it teach you? Why do people always want to talk about failure? <laughs> you know, I, I will tell you that, you know, I, I made these, I made, I, I took my 10 wishes in uh, college that were just kind of wild dreams. And I wrote them up, and I pasted them on my mirror. And I said, these are the 10 things I want to do. And I achieved, I achieved nine of the 10. And they were really pie in the sky. They were impossible things. And, and I, got, I made nine out of the 10. The only question I ever get is, well, which one did you fail? <laughs> well, so there have been a lot, of, a lot of failures. I think I could probably turn the meeting over to Diana, and she could take us into the evening on this. But I've learned, I've learned a, a lot. I, one of them that I would say that I learned as a, as a father, as a new father, was from Diana, where uh, I found that being an executive, having to run big companies, I found it was really easy to tell my kids, do it, 
Do it because I told you. You know, I'm right, I'm older, I'm bigger, do it. And I would come home and I would find Diana down on her knees, talking eye to eye with these kids, and I could say, that kid isn't understanding what you're saying, what are you doing? And yet, there was a confidence, a calm, a great thing was happening in the life of that child. So finally, I, I guess my mistake was being you know, too direct. I, I took too much of what I'd learned in business to the home, and she uh, fixed me. So I got better. Great, thank you. Um, Preston, who's here in person, asks, how do you think data will change how we perceive uncertainty? Well, I, there's nothing quite like facts and data, and we've now got the ability to mulch more data. And the question will be the discernment of what is relevant. I still think we've not become very good at figuring out how to make trade-offs. I think one of the best things that you learn in business school is this idea that everything is a trade-off. There are costs and benefits. I think business students are the best. So I, I work with a lot of scientists, a lot of doctors, a lot of political scientists, a lot of people. And they're not as good as the business school. But the business school people are really good at kind of assessing probabilities, costs, benefits, and applying those. So data will feed into that. And good data will actually make us more and more capable. But we've got to have that ability to make trade-offs. But, but I would say that all businesses are being uh, dramatically changed by data, big data, artificial intelligence. Thank you. All right, Joel also asks, how do you mentor and nurture leaders? So, um, number one, there's always this question of nurture nature. You know, are people, are leaders to the manner born? Are they born leaders or do they develop leadership? I have learned over time that leaders can be developed. People have natural proclivities, they lean towards things, but you can develop leaders out of people. It starts with principles, it starts with character. It's very difficult to, to uh, help a great young person become a great leader without them going through this exercise of determining their core values and, and being honest about those and adjusting where they're not there. That is step number one. I then tend to give people a little bit of rope uh, and trust them a little bit. And then when they deliver on that promise, trust them a little bit more. When they deliver on that, trust them a little bit more. Trust to me is one of these things that's built up a conversation at a time, a promise delivered at a time. Uh, so it's a delicate relationship, but I, I actually think that that's how you develop leaders by trusting them and giving them a chance to develop. The, the, the only other thing I'd add to that is giving them feedback. A lot of times people don't love to give feedback. I think developing a culture of feedback is one of the most important things you can do where we say, hey, it's fun to get feedback. By the way, here's something you could do better. And you have to embrace negative feedback yourself. You have to, I guess we can't physically hug people anymore, but you have to basically thank people when they give you negative feedback and say, I heard what you said, here's what I'm going to do to change, how am I doing at it? And making that culture of feedback fun. If that happens, you'll find yourself developing uh, leaders. Great. I've got, I've got a direct one here. Oh, go okay. ahead. So uh, I don't know if you all heard that. It's this idea of, of protecting your personal life and saying that we're all juggling. Every one of you is a juggler. You've got more to do. You've got more claims on you than you can possibly handle. So you're juggling all the time. And, what I did, and so the question is, how do you determine which balls are rubber balls that you can let drop because they'll bounce and you can pick them up later, and what balls are glass balls that if you drop, they'll shatter into a thousand shards? and you may never be able to put them back together. All I did was determine that my kids were the glass balls. <laughs> and whatever they needed, you know, I wanted them to know that for the rest of their lives, they could rely on their dad, that I would never let them down. 
Now that doesn't mean that I didn't occasionally miss a soccer game or, a, but I tried to coach them and I've made big, I'd get on a plane after a meeting. I, I remember skipping the last section of a class one time at Stanford to be home for a daughter's uh, state championship soccer game. So to, to me, those were the glass balls. That's awesome. Um, we have a question from Patricia Jones on YouTube. Do you find that diversity, including gender diversity, creates better results? And do you have any examples? Yeah, I, th I think diversity in general creates better results. You know, the, the notion in navigating is that we triangulate. We look at objects from different angles and we get, we're able to identify precise positions. Diversity, whether it's gender, ethnicity, background, whatever, gives us a different optic. The example I've always used is uh, um, of an orchestra where if you only had oboes playing, we would all walk out of the concert really quickly. You know, everybody's playing exactly the same instrument. That sound would drive us nuts. So we want the different timbers of the different uh, instruments. But likewise, if everybody were playing a different piece of music, it would be a cacophony we would have to walk out of. So to me, common values, different backgrounds. So I think I, I select uh, for people that really bring different optics, but they, they sh we share values. I think when you have values conflict, the best thing to do is get out of business with people as fast as you can. People don't adjust their values. And so I think that's one of the things that I interview for. I really want to understand values. What are your values? Your values are your priorities. Where do you spend your time, your money, and your mind share? Those are your values. Whether or not you like it, those really are your values. I have not always liked all my values. I spend time and money on things I wish I didn't. But you, want, you want to know those. You want to figure that out. OK, this question is from Jay Gibson, who's in the room. Can you elaborate what you mean by running towards the fire? Yeah, uh, so any of you who gets into the business of uh, delivering products and services to human blood and flesh, flesh and blood human beings are going to run into problems. There will be customers that are angry. There will be deliveries that are late. There will be people who fail. My experience is don't do this whenever that happens. Don't dodge the phone call. There was a guy by the name of um, Buck Rogers who used to be the head of sales for IBM, legendary uh, sales guy. And he said, my favorite call of the day is from an angry customer because I then can show them why buying IBM is the best decision they ever made. I want to be in the teeth of the problems. I want to hear those things. So to me, running towards the fire means where are the fires and I'm going to go and put those out or get people assigned to put those out. Fires, actually they start out as little sparks with a little bit of smoke and they turn into blazes and then bonfires and then wildfires and they can destroy you. So I think that's one of the, uh, uh, I guess that's enough. Awesome. All right, Johnny asks, what is the single most important event that took place in your business career that has shaped who you are today? Uh, this is another one you may not, the most important event that has shaped me today, you may not want to hear this, but uh, at the end of my Crow, Trammel Crow experience, uh, Diana and I moved to California. I started to buy companies and I was going to start in a second career. I, I had a bit of a disagreement with the direction of the company. Uh, a, within about a year or so, they invited me back to run the company. Uh, they said, We're, we need a turnaround, and uh, you're the one that we'd like to do that. So I came, turned it around. We, uh, just all of the measures, operation, financial measures, and everything, you could see that we changed inventories, we changed all these things, and basically had the thing turned around. And they wanted to roll up partners' interests to those of us who were the most senior partners. And I thought, I'm not sure that's ethical, and I'm not even sure it's legal, but in any event, I don't want to do it. So they told me, this is the deal of the century, Joel. I said, I understand that it's a great deal, but I don't really feel right about it. And so they fired me. They sued me in state court, in federal court, and in county court. And they sued Diana. 
I mean, it was, and for the next three years, we were in litigation. Now, that sounds like an event that could destroy your life. It could ruin your life. And it could, depending on how you see it. But I was in my mid-40s, and so fundamentally, I said, well, what do I do well? It forced me to say, what are my core values? What do I do well? And I started buying companies and backing entrepreneurs and going on boards, and, and I've become way more successful, in part because I needed to prove not only to the world that I was capable, but to myself, you know? When you have a failure or something that didn't work out quite right, you say, I don't know. You know, you can lose confidence. So to me, that was, that was probably the most important event. Thank you. We've got time for one more question. Um, quite a few of our students tuning in virtually and in person have asked, with you know, all the challenges going on right now and how difficult it can be getting to school right now, what is one final piece of advice you would leave for our students? Things pass. You know, this will get better. Have confidence. Uh, I actually think that uh, being an entrepreneurial leader, thinking about these kinds of things, where you will reimagine your company, reimagine your covenant with your customers, your covenant with your employees, your covenant with your peers. Rethink that. I mean, really be entrepreneurial. I think the, the, the time of the presider and the politician is really drifted way to the back. I think right now, entrepreneurial, people with entrepreneurial abilities, the analytical abilities that you all have, the courage, the core values are really going to be successful. One of the things that tends to happen in times like this is the strong get stronger and the weak get weaker. So I think you want to think about uh, that as you decide what to, what to do next. I also think there are a lot of completely new opportunities that are opening up. And so I really admire uh, what you've done here with this Master of Business Creation. I think it's a phenomenal idea. And Stanford may be starting one. <laughs> Thank you. Let's Thanks, uh, give a round of applause to Joel Peterson. <laughs> Thank you. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Boy, I hope you've enjoyed and been inspired by uh, Joel's remarks today. That is uh, a, lifelong, a lifetime of lessons that I think are uh, pretty amazing for all of us. Um, on a personal note, I think what I took away today, I appreciated your question about juggling balls and understanding what's fragile and what's not. Um, I'm sure your kids and family have appreciated uh, your realization over time. So thank you for those incredible, incredible words. We had nearly 270 people online watching this. So even though we were sparse in numbers today, we sure had a lot of people uh, tuning in and asking questions. Thanks to the staff for keeping track of those questions. Spence, thanks for 30 years of uh, a remarkable David Eccles School of Business. And as you always say, the best is yet to come. See everybody in class, perhaps, a little later this week. Thank you. Are there instructions on filing out? Exit where you came in. Okay, thank you very much.